10, 9, 8. <laughs> okay, well, we will not abort today. So I will uh, give a kind of a speed talk through our uh, Apollo guidance computer restoration, which has been chronicled in, in videos on my channel, Curious Mark. Uh, and that was an effort that included lots of people which are listed there. Ken is here today, we'll talk in more details about the Disky screen. Uh, so I'm Mark Verdiel. Uh, we also have Eric Schlepfer who has joined us uh, and is currently helping us restore the communication setup of the Apollo. And we have a few sponsors along the way. Uh, I should also acknowledge uh, Carl Clownsch, uh, who is now up in Florida, right? across from the pad, and um, Mike Stewart, who actually has the, the young engineer, which was the lead on the restoration, and he has a satellite to launch uh, today or tomorrow, so he cannot come. Uh, so the AGC, uh, where it's part of one of the four computers on the Apollo rocket, and uh, it's the, there is one that steers the booster, that's the LVDC made by IBM, and there are two AGCs, one in the LEM, one in the command module, and there's a backup system called the AGS. Um, so AGC, Apollo Guidance Computer, that's where it sits in the command module, that's the orange boxes, the computer itself, and the disk key, which is the screen and display. And the other color boxes are all the pieces of electronics that we're currently gotten and working on, so we have quite a bit of that. Uh, in the lunar module, it's on the back wall. Remember that it will become important in a second. So that's how it looks, a uh, 70-pound box. The computer is on the left, and the disk key, display keyboard interface is on the right. Uh, and I remember uh, when Dan Lickley was here on the stage uh, in 2019, uh, he was one of the programmers on the AGC, and the first question he was asked is, what did the AGC do? And he looked worried for 10 seconds, and he said, well, it did everything. <laughs> so, which is absolutely true. So the uh, Apollo spacecraft is a fly-by-wire um, uh, spacecraft, so it orients the spacecraft, controls all the burns, and guides them to various orbits, uh, it guides the lamb landing and the re-entry. So basically it's in charge. Even when Neil Armstrong takes it over manually, he's not in full manual mode. He just gives input to the computer and the computer will uh, react to it and orient the lamb. Uh, was developed at MIT. The principal engineer is, El is Eldon Hall. Remember that guy it also will become important later on. Uh, very pioneering system, uh, mostly because of Eldon. So this is the first time a, an aircraft, or even, heck, a spacecraft, is entrusted to a computer. Uh, very small by 1960s standard. First computer to use ICs, and actually that's the claim to fame of this computer. The legacy is to have brought up the, uh, the entire uh, IC uh, infrastructure in the U.S. We're still living on it, so the vast majority of the ICs sold in the 1960s were for that single computer, for that single program. Uh, interactive use of the computers through disk key, real-time OS, they invented basically everything uh, for real-time control. Uh, how do you get one? Well, ours came from this LEM, which is called LTA-8 and is in uh, Houston today on display. And this one never flew in, in real space, but it flew in simulated space. You can see it inside the uh, big vacuum chamber they have there, and it was used for the man rating, and they had actually astronauts in there uh, flying a full mission. So actually in the, on, the, on the CM, they stayed in there for 14 days. Um, so remember where it is, it's at the back. And if you squint and you look through the windows of LTA-8 in Houston, there is no AGC at the back. And that's because it was sold for scrap. And uh, which 
seems incredible today, but you know, they have a lot of those stuff and these uh, rules of this, you know, after the Apollo program is done, we're onto the shuttle, this old stuff, um, uh, they need to dispose of it, they are government rules, uh, you need to auction it, and nobody wants of the stuff, it ends as a scrapper, and it would have been uh, melted away if it were not for this guy, who uh, is a vintage electronics enthusiast, and he likes to go to scrappers, and he had actually worked for a very short time at Houston. He was in Houston, so he had work, no, everybody worked on that program, so he was a technician. He recognized at his favorite scrapper some Apollo stuff. The scrapper doesn't want of it because it's full of weird metals. He doesn't know what to do with it. So he can, can I take it? Say, uh, yeah, uh, and he took two tons of it. So in there, there is the AGC. He doesn't know at first. Uh, so it stays dormant in his collection for a long time. Uh, and then Mike enters the picture. So Mike is a young space engineer fascinated by space. He does flight software. Uh, he studies the AGC and he wants, and um, there is a simulation that's very good, uh, Orbiter, and he wants Orbiter to emulate exactly what the flight of the, of, of the spaceship, and for that you need an exact emulator of the AGC. And so he works on that, and from the documents they are unable to replicate it perfectly. And he says, okay, this, we cannot do it by just replicating the instruction, we need a gate exact machine. So he starts to build his gate exact machines, gets the schematics from the original engineers, and it's still not working. So, hey, okay, and I need to beep a real one, and he find that Jimmy, who has found that he has an AGC, wants to sell it, is going to exhibit it, calls Jimmy, can I beep the inside of your computer? And Jimmy says, yes. <laughs> and while he's doing that, well, he finds the last missing piece on, on his emulation, and Jimmy asks, well, could you power it up? And I say, oh, well, I don't know. Are you sure you want to do that? And Jimmy's, of course, interested in uh, you know, propping the value of his, of his item. And that's uh, where he contacts us, uh, because we have been known for restorations, and I say, well, would you be interested? And so we instantly drop all our bananas and fly to Houston. And we hide in a uh, motel room. Uh, Jimmy, understandably, doesn't want to be separated from his computer. Uh, he also is not very rich, he's embarrassed to have it as his home, so we do it out of a uh, hotel room uh, in Houston in October 2000, uh, 2018. And that's how I felt when <laughs> I saw the inside of the computer for the first time. So my goodness, no, you have to pinch me, you are going to work on this milestone of computing that put man on the moon. And so the inside has two trays, and I won't go very much about the technical details. We'll go more into the disky details with, with Ken. I'm just going to talk about the restoration. Uh, and, but one tray is mostly the logic with all these nice modules on the right. And that's tray A, and tray B is mostly the memory. It has core memory for uh, RAM, and it has core rope memory for ROM, which will cause us a lot of trouble. Just absolutely beautifully made. Uh, backplane is wire wrapped, uh, which was considered more reliable than a um, PCB at the time, and it, it actually is. Uh, and it's great because you can modify it or repair it. Uh, by the way, our IBM uh, 1401 downstairs is also wire wrapped, and we, we never have issues with the backplane. Uh, it's Ray 14, it's uh, from a series, the pre production series before the flight ones but it's identical in all respect to the one that flew, except the modules are not potted. So we could potentially repair it if we have a problem. So first thing we do, we look inside the modules and look at that, there's ICs in there, it's not only ICs, it's the surface mount ICs. Uh, and it's, I was also flabbergasted when I saw that. Uh, it's surface mount ICs, they are not soldered, they are welded, on the seven layer PCB. Right? And it's stuff that you wouldn't see for another 30 years in the, in the commercial world. So that's how far ahead they were. Right? You could make an argument that they were 50 years ahead of their time. Right? We haven't gone back. Um, and uh, all the same ICs. Right? They knew that if they had to bring up an industry, uh, they didn't have that much volume. They, they needed to concentrate on 
the effort on one IC. Uh, triple input NOR gates. Uh, actually, there's an, an other IC, which is also the first, so we saw the first digital IC over here. This is the first analog IC, use a computer, and this is for the uh, sense amplifier in the memory, and there are uh, eight of them, and they are at the, um, actually there are 16 of them, uh, eight per module, and they are at the bottom. It's not the red thing, it's the TO can at the bottom, uh, first comparator. Uh, and so I said they were unpotted. Well, it's not exactly true. There are two potted modules that actually do not belong to the original configuration. Uh, one is current switch module B11, and the other one is the erasable memory, the core memory. And so what are the chances that our faults are in the potted module? Uh, so Mike is very well prepared. He had spent years retrieving the schematics, which he eventually got from Eldon, uh, the engineer that squirreled them away. Uh, he has a complete replica uh, in his FPGA, so he has a complete simulation, and even the little glitches, you, you see one, uh, I don't have it on the, on the bottom left there, and it's in the actual machine. So we start by checking each logic module, and it turns out they seem to work. We do it first gate by gate, uh, and then later we are convinced that they, we can not find any faults. Uh, the power supplies check good. They didn't use a, they didn't use normal components, right? And they, all the caps were perfect. So, uh, however, we have a problem right away with the core memory module. Uh, so, core memory is easy to check because it's you no, know, it's little cores on wires, and you can check if the wires are connected. And there is one that's not. Uh, so, which is pretty bad, which means we have one bit at every location that doesn't work. Uh, so, we have no RAM. Uh, can uh, th this this thing uh, usually has core rope for ROM, but this is a development machine, and uh, so instead it has rope emulation that you tie to a real computer and is going to simulate the core rope, so you can actually load programs into it, and it's an undocumented box, um, and Ken gets a hold of it and starts to figure out what it is. Also made by Raytheon, and this is the notes of the master here at work. Um, so we have no RAM, we have no ROM, uh, but we decide to pair it, it up without the RAM and without the ROM to see if it's trying to boot. And to our surprise, it is. So it's hooked up to my logic analyzer, and we see the pulses of the sequencer. Yeah, I can't remember, 12 or 15 pulses and it's going to the right address, and at least reading something completely wrong, and we can figure out it's trying to execute this instruction. So that's, um, now our uh, genius Mike then immediately jumps on the bed with his computer and programs another FPGA and tries to make a memory emulator, and we had brought enough stuff uh, that we could wire it in, and with his memory emulator, uh, we get it to start to execute a few instructions, uh, maybe a hundred before it goes off the rail, uh, which was way behind what we expected to do in, uh, what was it one week of work, right, from uh, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. every day. Uh, so, regrettably, we have to leave. Everybody gets back home with a, uh, some work to do. I get the uh, memory module that has the broken wires, and we hope uh, to see the broken wire because we knew they had this problem right next to the pin, so I work for a company that has a good x-ray, we look at it, we can't see the broken wire. We get it back in the lab, uh, we confirm with TDR that the fault is actually not at the edge, so there is, we can't, no, the hope is that we could dig into it and, and reconnect, but we can't, it's straight in the module, we try also uh, to, uh, um, spectral way of doing it, to, you know, the wires and antenna, you can measure the antenna, it tells us exactly the same thing. The fold is right in the middle, the model is spotted, it's core memory, no way we can repair it, so we'll have to go around it. Uh, Carl is our props extraordinaire, he makes the disky replica, that's before we got the actual screen that we're going to show you, so it's made with LEDs. Uh, my company, Samtex Connector Company, they retool the connectors, uh, so we can actually connect it, it's a very unusual uh, connector. And that, that was uh, $25,000 worth of retooling. So we got really good sponsorship there. How do you know it's working? Well, when it's not attached to the spaceship, uh, it had a test monitor. 
So it's actually a blinken light machine, except the blinken light stuff is not flying with it. Uh, and uh, Mike makes another FPGA which implements it, and say, so there he, he can talk. So he's talking, he's testing the, uh, his replica with his monitor, both FPGAs, and you can see he has a little disk key and all the lights replicated. Uh, and finally, we managed to fly out uh, Jimmy, the computer, which can't be separated from Jimmy, which can't be separated from his wife. So I have to put them up in a hotel for two weeks in California. It's a whole thing. They lose the AGC in the plane, and it's really, it's really bad because at that time we, some, we have some press. We have the, the Wall Street Journal taking our... our no. A picture of our decomposed faces where we don't know where the AGC is. It reappears, gets in the lab, now we can actually work on it properly. Uh, Mike has full insight thanks to his, um, his test. So first thing, we have no, so the main thing, we need to get ROM and RAM working. So uh, Ken has reverse engineered the boxes, but unlike the, it's made by Raytheon, but it's not flight qualified. And unlike the AGC or everything Apple that we have, we power it up and generally it works. We're very careful, but generally it works. This stuff behaves like 50 years old electronics. So it has bad dipstick and construction. We have died, transistors that die, and the wires have disconnected or not existing. Uh, after we repair all that, it's still not working. Turns out the design wasn't complete. We need to add some capacitors. But finally, uh, we have success. Uh, Mike, through his test box, can see Ken's memory, so we got ROM. So now we need to get RAM, and before we get to our broken module, we have to check that the support electronics work, and remember, we have one other module that's spotted. Guess what? It has a fault in it, actually two. And Mike suspects that those are bad diodes, and it's spotted. What do you do? Well, you get into it. And we put it into the mill very carefully until we scratched the surface, got to the wires, then used dental tool to excavate it. We tried everything chemical before nothing worked. Then it turns out that this is the way, we didn't know, but this is the way they did it back in the time. There was one lady called Mary who would use dental tools and dig into the modules. And uh, later on, we actually bought some hardware with modules are holes in it, made by Mary. So we, we did it the right way without knowing. Um, and then, uh, so this is uh, an analog module. So analog modules are cord wood, so the components are inside a metal block. Uh, so we drill the diode out. We go to Anchor Electronics. They have the 1N914, still 10 cents a piece. They haven't changed the prices since 1964. <laughs> And we repaired the module, so we are modules has core logic in it, but you can see we are flipping the core. So they use very large cores to produce the pulses that will interrogate the smaller cores in the memory. And that one works. And we are all happy until for about a few hours because Mike continues to test the repair module and he finds another fault, and that one is way worse. It's a short. Uh, and it's short right in the middle, and we open up another pocket, and it's within the potted, so it's within the potted module in a potted component. So this is one of the cores themselves that generate those pulses that we saw. Uh, and it looks simple in the drawing, but there's hundreds of turns of wires, there's no, and it's, it's inside its own potting, there's no way we can repair it. Uh, fortunately, we have a communal brainwave and we figure out, so we are, the, ah, I, can I can show it, but uh, on the upper left, there's two things that are uh, connected together, so we're missing one winding, but we figure out that if we snip a few things and we put another transistor, we can recreate the signal in that winding. So here I go, it says clip, snip, uh, resolder, and we uh, add a transistor to the thing, ta-da! So it's our Frankenstein module, and it's repaired. So we actually, we really thought we were done for a, 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 for a moment there, but no, we make it work again. We have our pulses up and down, and then we tuck the module, and we tuck the transistor neatly. So uh, ah, now we have the 
control lo logic that works? What do we do for RAM? Well, it turns out they use, it's a 15-bit computer with a 16th bit that's used for um, parity control. So we swap the missing bit for the parity bit and we disable, we disable parity checking. And that you can do, it was a couple of wires, maybe four or five wires that you can, you can do uh, because you can rewire the backplate. So by that time, we have RAM, we have ROM, we're ready to test and we have a whole crew filming. Will it work? Uh, you won't have any sound, dang. That won't work. But basically what happens is that uh, Mike presses the go button and if it works, it will show up on this disk key. And ta-da, it's working. So we, we got it to work. Everybody broke into applause in the room, actually. <laughs> so it did run. Uh, the, the first thing we did is immediately dump the, 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 the memory content. And it told us that it, this time it was run, it was, we knew exactly what it was doing, where it was, it was in Houston, actually. Uh, and then we uh, went back to the Computer History Museum and we said, um, we have a working AGC. Uh, we think it can't read rope and you have an AGC downstairs with a rope module. Could we possibly read it? And after a, a little bit of convincing, they let us finally touch it. We got it, we recovered the uh, software in it. We ran it right there at the museum. Uh, on the other computer, so we had actually two computers, right, uh, running. Uh, and we made it to the local newspaper and to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and we went one step further, thank you, thank you. Uh, I have to rush through it because <laughs> I can't ask to talk to. Uh, we also hooked it up to, the, to what uh, Mike wanted to do in the first place, right, run the full simulation. Except now, not only he does it with the actual computer, which he hooked up to the rest of the simulation, and we can fly landing, and they are exact reproduction of the actual landings. And remember Eldon Hall? Well, we went to his place in Florida, and Mike flew a landing with his computer right in front of him. Unfortunately, he passed away two years ago, right, and at um, 98 years old, but he saw his computer land again. Uh, so we made a grand tour, we went to MIT, did it in front of uh, Don Isles and the other programmers, which by the way said, well, we have a few core modules, do you want to read them? <laughs> and then uh, we did uh, Ray 14 cells in uh, 2021 for uh, three quarters million dollars, which is three times what uh, the previous computer had sold. So we did something, Jimmy was happy, we were happy, but we don't know where it went. Uh, I expected the phone to ring after that because somebody paid a premium from a working one, but you can't make it work unless you have all the equipment, the tests and all that stuff, so, but we don't know. Uh, anyhow, I'll jump uh, over this, um, but in the meantime, we got our hands on a disky display, uh, which is right there, and Ken is going to talk about that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Disky display keyboard and what we have on the table over there. So basically, um, back in the 60s, most computers were punch cards, batch mode, um, but for Apollo, they wanted something interactive, and the Disky was the main way the astronauts would interact with the computer. So it was a very cutting edge thing for the time. Um, the Disky had three main parts. Um, in the upper left, you have your error and status lights. Um, at the bottom, you have this big, chunky keyboard. It was designed with big buttons so the astronauts could push the buttons when they had their, their space gloves on. And then on the right, we have the electroluminescent display, which is what we'll be showing. And um, it, was, it had um, numeric data. Well, the first line showed um, what, what program you're running. The second line showed um, what verb and noun, and I'll explain that in a bit. And then you had three lines of, of numeric data. So the, the, the interface was fairly primitive, but it was enough to get the job done. So the data display, you had these three lines of data, 
um, but there were no units displayed, so the astronauts had to know. And it was just a remarkable com um, combination of data. It could be feet, feet per second, nautical miles, hours, minutes, seconds, pounds, gravitation, degrees, mill radians, count, or octal data. And the astronauts just had to memorize what, what data they were saying at each time. So there was a lot of training involved. The other tricky thing is there was five digits with a decimal point, but they didn't show you the decimal point. You just had to remember where the decimal point was for that particular data, or you'd be off by orders of magnitude. So it's, it's kind of amazing that it all worked. Uh, so the AGC was centered around um, programs. Um, you had totally different software on the command module, the part that returned to Earth, and the lunar module that landed on the moon. Um, the command module had 45 different programs it could run, everything from pre-launch when you're sitting on the launch pad, boosting into orbit, um, going to the moon, and then re-entering the Earth. Um, on the lunar module, you had um, about 32 programs. This um, was service routines when you're coasting to the moon, thrusting to land on the moon, descending, ascending back off the moon's surface, and then if you had to abort the, the moon landing or run a back a backup thing. So the astronauts were constantly changing which program they were, they were running, and the disk key would show that program. So the whole user interface was designed around the concept of verbs and nouns. So each verb told, told the AGC what you wanted to do, and the noun said what you wanted to act on. So for a command, you'd enter on the AG, the disk key, you'd put push V and then the num numbers, then N and the numbers, and I would tell it what to do. And you had a wide variety of verbs, everything from display a decimal value to enable your engines or load data into the AGC. And then the noun said what you wanted to do that verb to. So for instance, noun seven, you want to change an address or a bit in the AGC. So verb 25, noun seven, was very important because Apollo 14, um, the abort switch had a short in it, and they were afraid they're gonna have, have to scrub the mission, but um, Don Isles managed to figure out how to reprogram the AGC to bypass that, and so the astronauts entered verb 25, noun seven, changed a few things in the AGC, and, and saved the mission. Um, another noun is the star code. Uh, that's important because for navigation, you'd use a, a telescope sextant on the spacecraft pointed at a star, and then you'd enter the number of that star into the AGC, and by getting the angle to several stars, the Apollo guidance computer could figure out exactly where you were. So there were three diskies in total. The command module had two diskies, one in the main control panel, and then one that was down in the lower equipment bay beside the, the telescope, so you could use that for entering your star sightings. And then in the lunar module, you had one disk key that was very important for the moon landing. So this is how it looked in the command module. Um, you had a whole pile of switches, and then in a fairly central place, um, in front of the three astronauts, you had the disk key outlined in red. And then this shows what it would look like in use. The second disk key, this um, is kind of a grainy photo, but it shows an astronaut looking through the telescope, aiming the sextant, and then they would use the disk key in the upper right to enter what star they were pointed at. And then in the lunar module, you can see in the lower center, there's the disk key that um, Armstrong and Aldrin could use when they're landing on the moon. So here's a side view of the disk key, and it's, it's a lot thicker than you might think. You know, it's just a display on a keyboard. Why is it so big? And as you'll see, there's a lot inside. Here's a back view. You can see it has a manufactured by Raytheon. It has a, a pretty large military style connector with a lot of pins because there was a lot of data going in and out of the disk key. And then above that connector is a pressurization valve so they could pressurize it with nitrogen to keep out any humidity. So this is a vintage diagram of the disk key internals. Um, there's a lot going on here, but I put in red the main, the main components. You have a, a keyboard which sends data to the AGC. You have a power supply. You have um, data coming in from the AGC, goes through a row decoder, and then into this relay matrix. There's a whole lot of relays inside. And then that drives your displays. And then finally, the, the, station and the, the status and caution lights have their own relays. So I'll start with the keyboard. Um, you'd push a button, and it would send a five-digit code to the AGC. 
Um, they had a whole big diode matrix to encode the, the coding. They didn't have you know, ROMs back then. They just have a bunch of diodes mapping. This button goes to these, these five bits. Um, the display itself was a very interesting technology. The display is what we have over here. Um, it was electroluminescent. And the main advantage of that was it was low power. Um, incandescent lights um, use a lot of power. They're also sensitive to vibration. Um, the disadvantage of the electroluminescent display is it requires a lot of voltage, um, 250 volts at 800 hertz. Um, because it's capacitive, the current is very small, so your power requirement is very small, um, but the power is a, a difficulty. Um, the display it has a you know, relatively short life. After a couple thousand hours of use, um, it can lose up to 60% of its brightness as the phosphor fades away. Um, one of the interesting things about it is it has this very interesting blue-green color, a very narrow spectrum, and it's hard to photograph. So um, the photos you see will either be too blue or too green, so you should come up afterward and see what, what's the genuine color. Um, here's a vintage diagram showing what's inside the display um, back to front. You have a, a glass panel with metal pins. Um, these have um, aluminum contacts. You have insulation. You have the, the phosphor layer, which I believe was zinc sulfide. And then you have a transparent electrode on the front. So basically, you have these two capacitive electrodes that are, are driving the phosphor in between. And then you have a, a glass plate on the front. So how do you generate this 250 volts? Um, well, what they used um, was a switching power supply. Nowadays, switching power supplies, you know, everybody has it in their phone charger, but back then it was a, a pretty rare thing. Um, they used transistors to chop up the 14-volt DC and then the 28-volt DC. They have um, three stages of transformers to boost the power, and so they get out 250 volts. Um, the astronauts had a knob so they could adjust the, the voltage so they could make the display brighter or dimmer as they needed. Um, as you get more dis digits on the display, it needs more power, so they had to regulate it. Um, they didn't have nice voltage regulator chips, so they used a magnetic amplifier, which um, was briefly popular in the 60s for, for these sort of applications. It's an inductor that can pass more or less current. Um, now, to get from the power supply to the actual display, um, transistors weren't up to the job of switching 250 volts, so they used relays a lot of relays, and they used latching relays that could stay in on or off state, so the relays also gave you your storage. Um, you'd think with seven segments, you'd have seven relays, but they managed to cut it down to five, and by using clever combinations of the relay contacts, they could drive all seven segments. And so they had a, a matrix of 12 rows of 11 columns of relays that were controlling everything. Um, it was set up uh, basically like this, you have uh, five, five, five relays for one digit, five relays for the next digit, and then a, an extra relay that controls the plus or minus sign. So how did the AGC send this data to the, to the whole DISCI system? Well, the AGC, as you recall, was a 15-bit computer because 14 bits wasn't enough accuracy to get to the moon. 16 was more than they needed, so they, they went with 15. So the AGC sends a, a four-bit selector of which row of the relay matrix, and then 11 column bits to turn 11 relays on or off. Um, they used a, a big diode matrix to decode the four bits, and then you would set and reset your relays. Uh, this is what a relay module looked like. Um, they had six of these modules. Each one had 20 latching relays for the digits, and then two non-not latching relays for the status lights. Um, the, the upper half um, that was your relays, and then the lower half was the diodes to do the decoding. So um, what we have up on the board here, we have two relay modules. Um, these are older Block 1 modules um, that were used um, before the, the manned Apollo, so it doesn't quite match the picture earlier. Um, we have the authentic power supply, and then we have the authentic display. So we don't have the whole disk but we have the display components. Um, we, to do all the um, to do all three all the lines on the display, you need three relay modules, and we only have two. So in the demo, the bottom two lines are going to be blank, and then we have a big board, um, a big board with a lot of transistors driven by an Arduino to switch everything on and off. Can you you might want to mention that the uh, 
the power supply and the relay modules are from the two tons of Jimmy's scrap, right? It's come from the same place. <laughs> uh, the, um, the display is a real flight spare that was sold at auction. Uh, so we have the whole documentation. It was just was never flown. And it had eight hours on the clock. Should we turn it on? Can we, can we dim the lights? Should, should, I, should I go over what, 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 what the show or do you want to jump straight into uh, why, why don't okay. you... Uh, did... Okay, so we're going to show three, um, three um, disky screens here. Um, the first one is verb 16, which means monitor a decimal location, and noun 44, which means we want to see the apocenter altitude, which is your, your highest altitude in orbit, your paracenter, which is your lowest, and your time to free fall, if, how, how long it's going to take you to hit the moon if you don't turn on the engines. Um, the second one is um, program 64, which um, was as they're approaching the moon landing. Um, verb 6 is going to display decimal values, and noun 64 displays four things. Um, 33 is the time you have left to redesignate your la landing site. Um, you, you have your landing point designator, um, which is an angle 29 degrees. And what that means is you look, you look out the window, and the window on the lunar module it has this scale on it, and it's marked in degrees. So you match that 29 up with the scale and the window. You look out the window, and that's exactly where you're going to land. So this is how they would tell what the current landing site is. And then it also show your altitude rate and your altitude. And then finally, program 63 is when you're braking as you're approaching the moon. Um, verb 5 means display an octal value, and now 9 mean, means display an alarm code. And you probably recognize 1202 alarm. That's the alarm that went off as they're approaching the moon's surface. So this is how they would see what the alarm was. And then they'd call Houston and say, what do we do about this? And they're like, oh, you know, go ahead with the landing. So this, you know, this display is a very dramatic display, which they actually saw on, on Apollo 11. So anyway, uh, Mark's going to power everything up. And um, you might want to come up afterwards to get a, a closer look. Yeah, so we pr also want maybe 30 seconds of silence. You can actually hear the relays clicking. So we made it actually a little bit more dramatic than the, the actual one, because the actual one would switch five, re actually 10 relays at a time, because it, it had enough bits to do that. And but we, we ripple them, so it makes even more noise. I don't think you could have heard anything in, in, the, in the ship. I don't know. We, we should ask an astronaut. <laughs> um, we also have uh, the one from Ben Krasno. So when we were lamenting that we didn't have a real disk key, and, but we did find the original uh, spec for the, for the art. Um, and I sent that to Fran Blanche and Ben Krasno. And Ben said, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll make one, but you know, don't, it's too hard. And then I never make the driver for it. And I, I didn't hear anything for six months. And six months afterwards, a, a video came through and said, well, I've done everything. <laughs> and then uh, he made his video, and then he came to our lab and said, hey, this is yours. <laughs> so this is the first, um, this is a modern reproduction um, made, made with amateur means of a, but using the exact same technology. The big difference here, and actually that was the main difficulty, well, one of the main difficulties in this build, is to do it, even today, to do a 280 volt driver AC is not easy, and it had lots and lots of difficulties. Uh, they also tried, uh, so I was very surprised they used relays, but of course they didn't have the transistors to do it. And there was some parallel efforts to not use transistors, uh, not, not use relay and do it with transistors and with uh, regular uh, light bulbs, but that was just way too power hungry, so that never went anywhere. Uh, I think we should ask, uh, uh, open for question, or do you have anything else to add? So we, le we left a lot of time for questions. We usually have quite a few, so. Over there. Yeah, so I, I read the ATC architecture about the book. Would you consider writing a book about the physical design of the ATC? Because you can probably 
can learn so much. Should I repeat the question? Yeah, please. Okay. I was just saying, uh, anybody who's interested, there's this really excellent book called um, Apollo Guidance Computer, Architecture and Operations, and I'm sure you've all memorized it. Uh, but yeah, it's a really great book, and I was just wondering, would you consider writing a book that sort of has a companion piece that goes into more of the physical design? Because you've probably learned a lot of things about uh, you know, the modules and the display. Yeah, we, we have been asked about that. Um, the, the person that should write the book is, is Mike, right? Because he's a walking encyclopedia. He knows the slightest detail. And unfortunately, I didn't think about it, but I didn't get good pictures either. We, we were con, con, contacted by an editor, and I, and I say, well, you know, I only have screen grabs. I was doing the video stuff, so we don't have good pictures. But if we find another AGC that's also unpotted and can take pictures, that's something we should probably do. It's a lot of work. Uh, those, you've written a book. You're writing one, but not on those subjects, so maybe <laughs> you'll do it. Look, can we have uh, other microphones for, or maybe I'll pass my microphone around if you want to ask for it. Okay. okay. Question back there? Sure. So you're, you're saying on the the AGC that you fixed, there were a couple of units, pieces that didn't work. Did they ever work? So, we can only conjecture what happened. Uh, my own theory on it is that it was in the lab. It's very easy to screw up core memory, right? If you get, because core memory, you, you have to send 500 milliamps for a short time on your wire, and if it lasts more than a few hundred, uh, few hundred microseconds, you'll, me you'll melt your wire. So if you get in, in a state where you're stuck in, uh, in flowing current, you can easily burn a wire. And I am th making that out of thin air, but I suppose there was an experiment done. They blew a module, a flight module, and in the lab, and they went, well, where is another one? <laughs> they took it out of... <coughs> this computer, and we got the bad memory and the, and the bad driving module that were involved in the accident, right? And, then, and it was a, obviously a short. They melted both the, uh, the transformer and the, uh, and, and the memory. And then our good modules went, so, so I think they were replaced on purpose knowing that they were bad. That's one theory, but I am just making that up. So, so that would explain why the two bad modules just happened to be the two ones that were potted, because they came from a different system, and then they, they stole our good modules and swapped them out. So we need to find who took the good modules. But that's conjecture. We don't, we don't know for sure. But what we know for sure is that those two potted modules are not part of the original build, because we have the serial number of every module, and those two don't belong. Question over there. Oh, one back there. Uh, truly amazing work, very inspirational. Um, what's the next adventure? Uh, wh wh what's the next goal? Uh, well, I, I, I actually, maybe I, I, I can talk a little bit about it. I, I skipped on some view graphs. Oh. And since we have a little bit more time, I might go on them. Um, so we lost our AGC, and then we lost our ability to read core ropes. And uh, Mike really wanted to archive as much as he could. So he made this contraption that you see on the left, which looks like a small AGC, but it's a core rope reader. It's the new USB uh, reader that you were waiting for. You just slide your fixed memory module into it, and it will read it. And uh, so that has been a lot of work. So this is what Mike has been spending his time. Uh, he has recovered the whole stuff on the left and has recovered partially the, the one on the right. Uh, it's amazing how many modules people have in their drawers or we can find. Um, I, I had more, uh, actually, I had more view graphs on that than my original. We recovered, uh, let, me, let me see if I can. Yeah, and so, so these recovered ropes are all available online at the I, virtual AGC if you want to run them on your, your own AGC. <laughs> let's see if I can get that one going. I might not, yeah, let's go. Uh, more slides in here. Um, 
Hello, computer, do something. There we go. So, so while, while Mark's getting that set up, um, we've also been doing a lot of work with the communication equipment from Apollo. Um, we have a bunch of the S-band equipment um, hooked up in Mark's basement, and we've been able to transmit using the actual um, transponder they used for, for the mission, and we've yeah. not been able to transmit not to the moon, but from one end of the table to the other. Um, but you know, this is the equipment that would transmit the voice, the, the data, the scientific data, and the television signal. And so we've been able to send television Great, signals you. through it using one Stupid of Mike's vintage. Windows computer doesn't let me get back into my vintage I, cameras. I've lost my. <sighs> so the, the the Apollo work is still actively going on, um, just not so much with the AGC in particular. Yeah. And then we have the CDU, right? Well, see, it's not working anymore. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. We've been cut off. Yeah, it's not working anymore. Anyhow, uh, we also have a quite, oh, there we go. Thank you. We also have acquired this thing, the CDU. So that's the one that is actually, uh, if you look at this, the, the uh, there is the EGC on the top, but right below it, there's a box that's almost as big, and that's the D2A, A2D for the five channels, and that's the one that is the root cause of the 1202. So when we, when we uh, flew the, uh, the missions on the real ones, of course, well, you, the first thing you want to do is try to reproduce the 1202. So first we get good enough that we can land, and then Mike says, okay, let's try to do the 1202, and we go through the... NASA report, we know exactly what signals to give to the AGC to give them the stuff that annoys it. And I build an Arduino box that does exactly that. And Mike tries to fly, and right very, when he's very close to the moon, he, he, he yells at me just, and, and, no, take it off, take it off. I can't control the, the spaceship anymore. It was going to crash, and pull the wires, and he lands, and see. And we're like, what? So he, he did get 1202s, right? But it, locked up the computer. And that sent us down the rabbit hole. What did that happen? We followed exactly the, what NASA had said. We put it in the real computer. We get a 1202s bit, it's not recoverable. And we started peeling the onion. Mike did a lot of it. And it it's, turns out that the 1202 that they had, when they say, we are go on it, they are we're not go at all. And depending on the conditions that happen, which are somewhat random, you can crash. And of course, that's not what the story says. Uh, so we wanted to be sure we could reproduce it with real hardware. For that, we needed a CDU, and we've got one. So we can uh, reproduce and test actually how many chances you have to crash and how many chances you avoid doing it. But the, uh, even the NASA report of it is not exact enough. So they were in much more dire straits, we believe, than uh, they thought they were. Uh, and actually, that's uh, one of those modules has a little hole in it that has been repaired by Mary. <laughs> that's what we found. And we have the uh, Apollo communication system. So we keep getting a lot of hardware from Apollo collectors, uh, more than we can deal with, to be honest. Okay, so that's. Sorry for the segue. Any other questions? Plenty. We have one over here. Thanks. Uh, so there was a 70 pounds uh, AGC and a lot of memorization by astronauts. Was also there was a manual, printed manual flying. Say that, say, I... Printed manual, how to use this AGC and this key. Or oh, was it, what, what, did they have a manual flying with yes. them? They had, uh, so I don't know, that would be a question for Mike, but I know that they had on the optics panel, if I go back all the way to the top, we here, come on. On, on the panel, so you, you see the EGC, do you see the red, uh, the orange box? And then go to the white panel above it, that's where the optics are. And there is a whole list of the nouns and verbs of the AGC. Uh, 
And then, of course, you have to, memor you have to memorize it because you, it doesn't give you any idea of those are just numbers. There is no decimal points, no, no idea what it is, but they, they, they had memorized the whole programs and what the screens were. Uh, but I don't know the actual answer to your question if they had a full manual with it. Question over there. There's plenty of questions. There's one over there, one over there, one over there. So take it in order, I guess. Maybe you pass the mic around. Go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was actually, I think I know the answer to his question. So they flew up with them on the spacecraft, just a whole bunch of different large books. You know, they had a flight plan to reference. And they also, I think for each spacecraft had a guidance and navigation dictionary, which was basically a large book with just a bunch of different tables of how the various programs on the computer work and what each noun, what kind of data it's showing, where the decimal point is, so that if they didn't know what a display was, they could just flip open the book and look for it. Oh, thank you. Okay. One more over there, one more. So, just, just go, goes right there. We'll, we'll try to get it around. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, you mentioned earlier in the talk uh, when you didn't have all of the hardware, uh, you were emulating some parts with FPGA. Uh, is there any coordinated project to replicate big chunks of the Apollo guidance computer using FPGAs, like uh, uh, that Mr. Board that they uh, used for a lot of, uh, like there, you can do a PDP simulator running space war and stuff like that. Right, so there's the, the FPGA code and everything is already public, so you can replicate what Mike has done and want to say anything? You're good. Maybe. <laughs> It's like the, the Olympic torch. I guess. <laughs> um, so I had a question about the diskey display. What, what you have running in the demo is going by very fast. Di how fast was that changing for the astronauts? How fast did they have to look at it and go, OK, I need to interpret that before the next thing came by? Well, so well for, for the most part, it would be you know, they would enter a verb and noun, and then it would respond by displaying a display. Um, some of the up displays would update, you know, every, I, I guess every second with like what your current time, what your current distance is. But it wasn't like, you know, scrolling like a marquee like we have here. Yeah, so, so this is a little bit misleading because it's a demo where we are flipping to different programs. So you would get a noun, a verb, a noun, and then you have a stable display. And then you look at the numbers and it, was, it would not do the, the, this like this. So they, and, and they had very specific time the mission where they switched displays and nouns. So it's, it's actually, if you memorize it, it's a very, very nice user interface. I have a question for Eric. What do you call a tick on the moon? Uh, I don't know. What do you call a tick on the moon? A lunatic. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Eric does all of our dad jokes on the restoration session. <laughs> so, if I remember correctly, the uh, stage one of the actual uh, of the actual rocket had a very interesting quintuple redundant flight computer. I was wondering if you have any, if you've like, have you been able to get your hands on one of them? Uh, have you looked into that? So it's a triple redundant, it's a LVDC. It got quintuple redundant in the shuttle, actually. So triple redundant in the Saturn V, made by IBM, called the LVDC. And uh, that's another thing I haven't touched on. So Mike is, uh, so we, we don't have one. Uh, it, it's a more secretive computer than it was, you know, unlike the AGC that was done at MIT. Uh, this one was private IBM and then we were using the military, so very little information on it. But Mike has made an FPGA emulation of it that he got running last month, I think. So as, as of last month, he's executing code on the LVDC replica that he has, and that's also on his uh, GitHub. Uh, if you find a computer, I would want to know about it. <laughs> No, unfortunately, I don't think I have any of those in my closet. 
So we, we did get our hands on a, a few of the boards from the LVDC, and it's um, interesting technology because it's um, IBM's, um, it's like their SLT modules that are not quite integrated circuits, but modules that have individual um, tiny, tiny surface mount transistors and diodes inside a module that looks like an integrated circuit. And yeah, one more question, uh, two more questions. And, and then I would like to leave the five last minutes for people, because we are going to, for safety reasons, get it back uh, away. Uh, but if you want to spend some time seeing it from close, just uh, feel free to do so. And maybe we turn the lights down also again. So one, uh, where, where, where are more questions while I'm doing that? Two more over here. Um, so, I was wondering, since you have the ability to load, or you had the ability to load programs onto the computer from a computer, well, a file on a modern computer, or I assume you did something along those lines with the Core Rope emulator, has there been any work done on, like, making new code for the computer. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. So I wrote a Bitcoin miner to run on the AGC. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, unfortunately, it would take longer than the lifetime of the universe to mine a Bitcoin because of the, the, the AGC is a little slow. So it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not very financially rewarding. <laughs> Okay, one more question. Do you mind dimming the light and I'll invite the people to come up and see the, this key for close because we have only four minutes before the next speaker. So I'm just curious, back in the day, how, how would somebody write a program for AGC? So, so they had this um, Honeywell mainframe that they would use um, uh, guys, you can basically to, to manage their code and so it was kind of like GitHub running on a mainframe where they would check in changes and every change was tracked and who could change things. And then um, basically that they would run an assembler on this mainframe and, and then they would send their code off to um, be manufactured into the core ropes um, by women who are weaving wires through, the, literally weaving wires through the cores. So it was a, a complex process. 